Okay, so welcome back. Um, in our poll, it seems that we have two uh, potential future visions for the how to organize innovation. And those are uh, innovation meets education, that received 38% of the votes, and uh, waste-based innovation, that also received 38% of the votes. And then 90% innovation for 90% for of, the, of the population has received the least votes with 23%. Uh, thank you for the vote. We will get back to these results also later in, at the end of the seminar. And then I give over to Carl-Erik. Thank you. Um, well, we have now the, the main event of, of the day, which is our panel of uh, distinguished members here. We are very honored to have you all here. Um, on my left, Willy Mietinen, Microtask, CEO. Timo Hämäläinen from Citra. Ilin Niinistö, Minister of the Environment. Guy Ahonen from Institute of Occupational Health. And Etta Sartner, philosopher, Aalto University. We will, um, um, in the panel, explore that question up there, which is uh, how do we improve the effectiveness of innovation in achieving higher well-being for all people in society in the future? And uh, the way we will conduct this is that uh, first each uh, one of the panelists uh, will give a very, very brief presentation on his stance on, on that particular question. And then we will have a, a, an open debate about the issues. That and at the end, I hope we will also get some uh, possibilities for questions from the audience. So, please, Will. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, my name is Willy Miettinen, and I'm a hacker and a serial entrepreneur creating high-growth technology startups. Uh, at my previous company called Hybrid Graphics, uh, we invested about 100 man years and millions of euros to build the core technology for rendering 3D graphics on mobile phones. We licensed this to handset manufacturers like Nokia and Samsung, and they provided it to third-party developers, who's, uh, who in then, in turn, built popular consumer apps, such as Angry Birds. We had little idea how our enabling technologies would be used. However, bringing any new tech to the mobile phone industry requires the collaboration of hundreds of companies and years of standardization. So before any of our innovations ever reached consumers' hands, there was sufficient time for thorough research, to write papers, and even books about the topic. These days I'm mentoring a number of uh, consumer web and mobile internet startups, and for them, the rules of the game have radically changed. Launching a consumer software product is nowadays fast and cheap. One can bring a product to the market at a fraction of what it used to cost. And this is partially due to recent advances in distribution, uh, such as the app stores, but also because modern web and mobile development has few upfront costs. Cloud computing means you don't need to invest into physical hardware, and most software uh, and libraries are available as open source. Steve Blank defines a startup as a temporary organization designed to search for a scalable and repeatable business model. So modern startups release their products in beta. Often the basic product is provided for free. Then they iterate quickly based on the feedback from the uh, early adopters. They pivot. That means that they quickly change their strategy and experiment with different potential business models. There's immense time pressures. We're now seeing product cycles of months, even weeks. In the global connected world, ideas get quickly disseminated, and many people come up with the same ideas at the same time. So the startups are competing for the same customers and the same venture capital funding. The investors want to place their bets only on the category winner. Because apps and services can now reach hundreds of millions of people connected to each other, they often have profound effects on the society. If we look at startups like Skype, Twitter, Amazon, LinkedIn, Wikipedia, Groupon, or Airbnb, they have all dramatically disrupted industries and how consumers behave, how they shop, and how they communicate with each other. Uh, Napster changed the music industry forever, Google the advertising industry, and Facebook our social lives. Now the good news is that unlike earlier, 
masses of uh, end users are participating in the creation of the products and can influence them from the very beginning. The bad thing is that most of the young, most of the disruptive innovations are done by young entrepreneurs experimenting with unfinished products with a live audience, often with limited understanding of what the final impact will be on the systems level. And like controlled markets such as uh, pharmaceuticals, there's no requirement for licenses or trials. It seems that our ability to innovate technologically and launch services to the masses trumps completely our skills in anticipating and uh, solving the social consequences uh, of these innovations. We can expect the industry to police itself to some degree. Uh, a recent example about this is, was the stalking application called Girls Around Me uh, that combined publicly available data from Facebook, Foursquare, and Google Maps. And while it wasn't really breaking any laws per se, it was creepy enough for both Apple and Foursquare to ban it. It's obviously very difficult for the society and the legislators to anticipate exactly which disruptions are coming and when they're coming. So it's hard to combat their negative social impacts in advance. But what we can do is to make sure we can react rapidly to the changes after they have happened. Some things we need to address in our le legislation in the next few years include copyrights and patents, internet censorship, taxation of virtual goods, privacy issues, and so forth. And these are very complex topics requiring the expertise of a very heterogeneous group of stakeholders. Not only technologists, but social scientists, economists, psychologists, pedagogues, and many others. And an example of this kind of new thinking is the Finnish uh, Avoy Ministry, or the Open Ministry Project. And that's uh, basically Wikipedia for creating new legislation. So the same technologies that create changes in the society can also be used to mitigate their negative effects. And I'm hoping and expecting to see many other novel approaches for bringing us all I mean, the people who are affected by these social impacts to participate in addressing them. Thank you. Thank you, Uli. Okay, thank you. I hope my mic works, yes. Um, good afternoon. Um, I would take a, a, a bit more uh, research-oriented perspective to, to this important question. Um, I would like to take up two, two main points. Uh, one, I think we need a better understanding of everyday well-being in our societies. Uh, to direct innovation activities. And secondly, I, I think we, um, we're living in a, uh, uh, in a society and in, in, in an economy that is a complex adaptive system. And we would uh, need to have a better understanding of how such systems work in order to understand how innovation can contribute. Uh, taking up this uh, uh, well-being understanding challenge first, uh, I would argue that we tend to discuss well-being in an outdated uh, frame uh, that uh, solely emphasizes uh, uh, deprivation-oriented problems, uh, which are still important in our society, but we have uh, new types of well-being challenges at the moment, uh, mo many of which have to do with uh, life management problems and, and mental well-being, which should be incorporated into our understanding of well-being. Uh, we are currently engaged in CITRA uh, in, uh, in a research project uh, with New Economics Foundation in London trying to uh, tackle these new challenges to well-being so that we would have a more holistic perspective uh, about the determinants of well-being in, in our lives. Uh, so if uh, we had such an understanding, I think uh, the innovators uh, both in Finland and in other countries could uh, better contribute to our, our well-being and add more value to our lives. Um, and I think that would be a good strategy also for Finland because we can only compete with value added. And, 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 and if we had the best understanding of well-being in the world here in Finland, uh, also foreign firms would like to come here and, and uh, innovate in Finland and, and hence add more value. Now the second point uh, had to do with this uh, complexity of our societies and, and economies at the moment. Um, there are some people in, in, the, in the audience who've studied these issues thoroughly, like uh, Esco there uh, on the side, and, and, and they emphasize that uh, complex systems uh, behave in a way that are difficult to, to manage and understand uh, with the traditional sort of hierarchical logic. Uh, there are multiple levels of systems. Uh, they're nested within uh, each other. Uh, you can think about individuals, organizations, uh, societies, and even uh, like the European Union. Um, 
there are emergent processes which are difficult to anticipate. Uh, there are biological, uh, physical, and human components in these systems. And they have different time scales and geographical scopes and functional scopes. And I would argue that uh, many of the unintended, undesirable consequences of innovation stem from this uh, uh, difficulty of us understanding how these different time scales work uh, and interact. Uh, how our um, activities and, and choices have an impact on the other side of the globe. Uh, how our choices uh, diffuse in a network uh, from one stage to another to a third and so forth. Um, so I think we should uh, try to understand our economies and societies in a more holistic and systemic way and, and uh, by doing so I think we could uh, uh, develop better innovation. Yes, good afternoon to you all from my behalf as well and it's good to continue from this because I was also about to speak about the, the uh, connection between global huge uh, phenomena and local uh, small uh, issues. And uh, in the current uh, economic system that which we are living in, and if we think about the, the limits of, of the economy, the problem is that we don't actually, uh, we haven't built an economy that understands the limits of this planet. And that's both social and, and uh, environmental. And uh, being the Minister of the Environment, I, I guess you obviously realize that I'm talking a bit about the, the environmental limits of the planet. If we think about uh, the challenges we face as, as, as the global economy, we have uh, now at the moment we are over consuming about 40% of the resources that are renewed every year. So we are borrowing from the future generations. Then we have the sixth uh, big uh, 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 loss of biodiversity period going on in the planet, loss of species. And then we have climate change, which is uh, rapidly uh, going forward. And, and uh, researchers now are saying that it is going to be very, very difficult to limit the climate change within two degrees of, of global warming, which is the uh, uh, political goal we have uh, set for us. And uh, to achieve the limit, limiting of, of climate change to two degrees still uh, involves the uh, research, research based risk of, of 50% of, of, uh, of uh, uh, such changes in the, in the, in the ecosystem which are uh, uh, going to affect the basics of our, our, our economy and our societies. So there's a 50% of, of risk of, of uh, including uh, um, uh, huge uh, consequences even uh, with a, a limiting of, of two degrees of global warming. And then if we think about uh, how we have built our economy, so we, we still are very much in a raw material based economy where we get minerals out of this, this earth and then we turn it to something and we don't really much think about trying to make more out of less, trying to make more out of that which we are already using. And this great paradigm change is going to happen in the next 10, 20 years. And, and the reason for that is that the most raw materials in the world are, are diminishing in amount. And raw material prices in the last 100 years, they have given us, us uh, economic growth that we have increased productivity in using raw materials in the last 100 and, and so years. And, and the prices have gone down until about last 10 years. And now the prices of raw materials, resources are going up in the last 10 years. And this includes the very basic of, of human, human well-being, the basic uh, ingredients for, for life, that is pure water and food. Uh, and if we think that we have 7 billion people in the world at this moment, and uh, by current estimations we are going to eclipse in 9, 9 billion in, in, uh, up until 2050. Uh, we are going to have to make more out of less to provide all these people with basic well-being. And then to add into this, this um, uh, challenge the, also the possibility of economic progress and social well-being and, and in increasing that, it's clear that we have to change the whole rationale of, of how the economy works. Um, so 
from my viewpoint, if we think about innovation, we have few challenges and, and we haven't realized that current generations are using more or less borrowing from the future generations in a way that, that the cost of our actions is not, is not included in the prices of our products. So, so what we have to do is to somehow make these long-term costs uh, uh, actual in the prices and make the long-term beneficial, sustainable innovations cheaper and those that are harming the environment uh, have to be more expensive. So it means that we have to have uh, state involvement in this, we have to have uh, public procurement that are, that are making this paradigm change faster. But at the same time, it's clear that the state doesn't uh, decide which sectors are going to be the green sectors or which innovations are going to be the ones that are solving this problem. So, so for me, it's important that we as politicians are, are creating a kind of an environmental and socially just uh, um, framework for innovation to take into account as fast as possible the longer term costs of, of, of the kind of society and economy they are building. And, uh, and, uh, and as, as this is at the, at the same time, it's a huge challenge and, 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 uh, and a problem, you might say. I also like to have the kind of solution-based approach that this is actually a, a big possibility for Finnish society that, that, we, that if we focus our, all our innovation efforts into seeing the connection between small innovations that make everyday life easier, uh, and, and also realize that these innovations have to be built up in a way that also solve this global resource issue and, and environmental uh, uh, limits uh, issue, then we actually can accelerate economic well-being and economic growth and social justice uh, also in, in, in short term. Uh, and if you think about the kind of issues that Ville was speaking here about, or Timo as well, then, then, we, then we have to... Uh, somehow uh, realize that, that the economy is moving more and more away from, from the raw material-based, uh, uh, industrial-based, uh, product-based society into a society of services, higher quality goods, better materials, more from using waste uh, and the kind of existing raw materials we already have in our, our ex existing products. Urban mining, for example, is a more effective way of, of, of getting raw materials than opening new mines in, in northern Finland in the long term, because the, the mines there are going to create well-being for 20 years, but urban mining, getting more out of the products we already have by recycling, is creating more in the long term, because it creates innovation that's lost for, for generations, and we get more productivity out of less. So, so, so the challenge for the society is how we can make these kind of innovations faster, that has more programming, more content than, than hardware, and how those kind of innovations can also uh, make the material structure of the, our society uh, environmentally and socially more just. Thank you, Kalerik. Uh, I work for the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health and uh, leading the, the function of uh, uh, influence through knowledge and uh, my perspective is uh, work well-being uh, when if we think about uh, innovation uh, we all, I think we all agree that uh, that the ICT revolution is uh, is the most uh, uh, powerful uh, area in which we have these innovations and they affect also the working life uh, there are many good things as a result of, of these uh, 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 numerous innovations. Uh, if you look at, uh, think about the current trends in the Finnish working life, life there is, uh, for instance, uh, people have more chances to work uh, on a distance. Uh, the flexibility has increased. Uh, the work has become uh, less monotonous. Uh, more people have uh, more opportunities to change their, their uh, uh, work. Uh, there is more teamwork, uh, there are more female uh, managers. There are <coughs> many good things, and uh, many of them are related to the ICT revolution. Uh, but there are unfortunately also many bad things, and uh, 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 the number one uh, factor which uh, increases poor satisfaction at work in Finland is, is uh, hurry, 
the Finnish word kiire. That, that is the thing that, uh, uh, that uh, makes our work miserable. And uh, uh, that is uh, to many extent related to the IC, uh, ICT revolution. There are uh, other related uh, trends, uh, tighter timetables, uh, more interruptions in work, uh, uh, poorer working climates. Uh, bullying is a particularly big problem in Finland. Uh, uh, the work has become mar more unpredictable, uh, more changes all the time. Uh, unclear work, life, borders, uh, People are more reachable in their uh, leisure time. Uh, we have more uh, back and uh, shoulder problems. These are also related to the uh, uh, ICT revolution. And uh, uh, if you think about practical things, uh, uh, things which have affected uh, tremendously our work life is uh, uh, the whole email technology and, and, uh, uh, and this, uh, the communication that has become much easier. Uh, we have all kinds of electronic services uh, like uh, travel reports, uh, time management, and, uh, and so on. Uh, the, the thing that uh, uh, many people find uh, uh, very uh, uh, difficult and harmful is that uh, uh, because of this rapid change, we are always, uh, all the time using, uh, uh, you could say, uh, beta versions of programs. So, uh, they are not uh, fully complete, and um, I think that everybody in the audience recognizes this problem. We are using programs, uh, services, uh, uh, which doesn't really, which do not really uh, function well. Um, if I would have to bring up one solution uh, to this problem of uh, new technologies, uh, constant change, that one solution would be that we should uh, have parallel technologies. Uh, when we go in for new technologies, we should keep there aside with the new, new solutions, the old solutions. Uh, one uh, uh, practical example is this, uh, uh, this uh, travel reports. Uh, there there are, have been uh, uh, great stories about those in, in the newspapers, how people going on a one-hour trip make, uh, uh, use eight hours for making the report. So uh, I think that uh, we should allow those people who, who not very often make these reports to use the old paper sheet and, and make it there. I think it's such a simple solution, and uh, I wonder why, uh, why we haven't adopted that. So that would be one solution from today. Thank you. The difference, let, let me uh, pick up from some of the words that I, 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 I think were important in what we just heard uh, and then build up from that. There was, I think, uh, the theme of uh, disruption in, that, that really emphasized rapid uh, reaction, also energy uh, in, in, in Vila's personality, um, well-being, uh, complex systems. This is what Timo emphasized. Uh, there was uh, long-term costs that, that, that uh, Vila brought up. Uh, old solutions. Now, of course, uh, me, myself, uh, representing philosophy, this strikes a note in me, the theme of old solutions. And uh, having had the chance of reading some parts of the book that is, is uh, going to be um, brought out today, uh, with, which I think is a remarkable book, it, it really is, uh, to me at least, astonishing how that book seems to succeed in challenging the innovation paradigm. And, and it led me to think, could be there something on the basis of philosophy that could, in some sense, form at least a partial counterforce to this kind of um, one-sided uh, uh, innovation imperative, whatever its form is, and, 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 and Kari, of course, pointed out some of the possible forms. And, and, and then I thought, that actually, there is one and it, it really is just, I think, the key lesson from all of, at least, Western philosophy. Because I think the, the key line of all of Western philosophy is, don't believe your own bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, you could say, this, this is the Socratic line. Uh, we, we all know this, this uh, figure of 
Socrates walking around Athens and, and uh, challenging people's thinking. But basically that means don't believe your own, your own bullshit. Now this uh, threat of believing our own bullshit, of course, is increased, should it be the case that there is kind of an ideology uh, built into our society which uh, favors a particular kind of bullshit. And uh, the new book basically, I think, challenges uh, or, or brings to the surface some of the key features of it. So from my point of view, looking into effective innovation that would work the way uh, the, the, um, the challenge we read uh, uh, as an introduction to this, this little panel, I think it, it, it isn't possible without us addressing as people this lesson, don't believe your own bullshit. So this would be, from my point of view, point number one. Uh, and that based on uh, the, the old solution of philosophy that also reminds us of the fact that people so easily fall into all kinds of forms of self-deception. Self then the second point. Now, uh, at first when, when, when I looked at the new book, I was a little bit sort of uh, feeling uneasy because of the fact that most of the time I like to look at the positive. And in a sense, what the book basically amounts to is, is challenging some of my sort of basic orientations in this particular dimension. But then I thought that, well, actually, this is exactly right because of the fact that when you look at, let's say, the best work on team dynamics conducted by uh, Esko Kilpis, uh, good friend, uh, Marcel Losada, what it basically amounts to is that uh, the most effective teams uh, are able to uh, balance positivity with negativity. It's the ratio that is, 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 is critical. So uh, best dynamism in, in team context doesn't come out of sort of uh, over ex exuberant positivity. You need to have the negative. So it seems that, uh, that, that the second conclusion then would be that, that we need to, as it were, counterbalance the, 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 the positivity discourse with an appropriate uh, negativity discourse. But that basically means uh, uh, um, drawing from the don't believe your own bullshit uh, um, source. Maybe it's something like five to one. This is Losada's uh, ratio, basically. Uh, but we know, of course, know, and this is what the book uh, emphasizes, I think, so lucidly, that at the current time, that's not the case. And then the last third point. Uh, listening to this speech we just heard, and also uh, think about the, the, the opening address, <coughs> you know, I, I would say that, that uh, a, a, another imperative that, that we need to address, in addition to don't believe your own bullshit, is uh, don't believe uh, the globe could not flourish. Notice it's one thing to, to come up with innovations uh, directly to uh, uh, making the situation such that that, that you don't survive, but, it's, but if you target flourishing, then it's clear that you want to do things together with other people. You want to look, look at uh, creativity with full force. But it could be that we set the ceiling too low, too low in this respect. So, so it's these two lessons, I, I think, that, that I, I would bring from, from philosophy on the one hand and, and from my personal perspective on the other hand to the table here. Thank you. Thank you all. Issues that came up while the others were talking. Well, yeah. There was one thing that, that uh, struck me when I was listening to my colleagues here, that uh, uh, the potential that lies in the fact that uh, economic growth doesn't seem to coincide with the growth of happiness. So uh, there, I, I see that as a as a, as a chance, as a possibility, and, uh, and uh, so, so uh, uh, somehow it relates to the theme of the, of the day. I don't quite know how, but, but I think that there is something in it. <laughs> yeah, I could uh, continue with that line of thought, because I think it's, uh, it's quite obvious that we, we have kind of 
uh, we have uh, the Rio Plus 20 meeting in, in June in, in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, where we are talking about sustainable development and how you actually build the three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic, and environmental all together. And what we have done so far is that we have kept them very separate. And, and, and uh, that's, that's uh, to, to answer your question, is that, that how we can create a kind of an economy where happiness is included in the measurements and, and goals of, of what we are doing and what we are innovating. And happiness, in a sense, should include the limits of the environment and, and the limits of what people can bear, to be short. And, uh, and, uh, and this is one, one uh, fundamental uh, issue to be solved is that, that in addition or instead of speaking, speaking just about GDP, we have to speak about the other measurements, go beyond the GDP. How can we measure the uh, quantitative uh, and qualitative uh, structure of the society? Because the economists who actually first came up with GDP, they didn't mean that it would somehow be a measurement of if, is, the, if the, is the society progressing or is it good. It's not a moral uh, measurement. It measures the size of the official economy. It has nothing to do with of the, the quality of the economy. And, uh, and therefore, uh, trying to read quality into something which never actually intended to include quality is, is, is quite difficult. So we have to somehow um, realize that the kind of material level, Richard Layard, for example, has, has done studies on this, the kind of material level which uh, creates uh, uh, materially uh, good enough level standard of living for happiness was achieved somewhere in the 70s in the Western world. And now we just have to divert the rest of the economic patterns to increasing happiness instead of just speaking about getting more. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can pick on this uh, measurement issue here because it relates to the research project that I was mentioning uh, in, in, in my, my words. Um, there's a lot of activity around developing these new well-being indicators and that's important because we don't have good indicators in, in use yet. Um, but there seems to be much less activity around trying to better understand uh, this phenomenon, well-being. Uh, we have lots of uh, scattered research in different disciplines which take a narrow perspective to it, but we don't seem to have a, a, a sort of holistic idea uh, of what well-being in good life is in, in today's society. And, and I, I think this is a, a little bit risky situation because uh, ultimately we will have well-being indicators but I, I would like them to be based on a very sound understanding and holistic understanding of, of well-being even if having an absolutely good uh, understanding of it is probably impossible because we've tried that for two or three thousand years already and we still don't have it but I think we in today's society which is changing rapidly uh, we cannot rely on our old understanding of well-being anymore because society is so different and people's life patterns are so different. We should try to aim for uh, a sort of fresh understanding, holistic enough, uh, and then build our indicators on that understanding. Uh, you mentioned, Guy, the, the society's um, kire. And uh, is it that we are sort of coming towards a, a beta version world where we never ever get to see the final product or innovation, but everything is just sort of halfway there. And that's, that's, how, that's, how <laughs> I, that's how I feel it uh, myself and, uh, and that's what you can see in, in, uh, in ver various research. And actually I would, uh, I would like to ask our technology expert, that wh why is that so? Why are we living in a beta world? <laughs> I mean, I, I mentioned earlier, like, one of the reasons is that it is just so cheap and easy to bring immaterial products into the market. It's, it doesn't require almost any funding whatsoever. And, that's, uh, and there, a <laughs> primary motivator is, uh, when you're bringing a new service, is really to just build up, uh, build up the user base as rapidly as possible, because that's the primary motivation for uh, bringing in external uh, external funding, and so you need to demonstrate this 
crazy uh, growth. And obviously, when you don't have any time to do things properly, you will end up coming up with beta or even mm -hmm. earlier version of products. <laughs> what does, sorry? Yeah. Uh, as as uh, Guy was uh, implying with this question, uh, it, it, it seems obvious that uh, this hectic pace of changing technologies is, is often bad for our well-being. And, and uh, this uh, busyness of our lives uh, seems to be related to the fact that we have more opportunities uh, to, to design our lives than, than ever before. Uh, countries like Finland are more affluent than ever. Uh, we are freer than ever to, to make our choices. The culture has opened up and, and become much freer. Uh, and the markets are surrounding us with powerful messages all the time. And, the, and one of the key problems in, in, in well-being in today's society is this problem of choice. It's not uh, scarcity of things. It's actually that we are living uh, in a world where we have to make uh, uh, dozens of choices every day. And we are very, not very good at making these choices uh, as, as human beings. We make mistakes. We are short-term oriented. Uh, we are too self-centered. Uh, and, and we don't understand how the world is changing around us very well. Um, so uh, we end up with uh, all kinds of problems with, which have to do basically with our decision-making capacity that is overwhelmed by this choice around us. Let, let, sorry, can I, can I pick up from that? Because uh, basically I would say uh, that for a human being, uh, it's good to do good. But if you don't know what would be good, you know, it's difficult to do good. Uh, and uh, this is our situation, I would say, that, that, that people just don't know how to do good. Uh, and and this, this means, I think, that, that we need also conceptually um, grasp uh, the, the holistic situation in which we de facto live uh, more clearly. And this is what Timo basically, I think, was pointing to, as well as Ville, because uh, to the extent that, for instance, on the level of uh, the key national discourse, uh, uh, cross-national product and that kind of economic uh, parameters are the key parameters as opposed to, let's say, happiness. And, and in many cases, um, uh, in opposition to happiness. Of course, it means that people don't know how to do good if doing good means, for instance, creating happiness. So therefore, it could be that our whole sort of machinery of innovation, to use that term, is geared in, 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 in a weird direction in a number of ways. Uh, and and uh, I think this de facto is the case. So, uh, so, so one, one, one uh, step ahead, at least to some extent, would be for us to be um, more clear regarding what's good for human beings, and and and, and, and I, I mean, surely just to cut it a little bit further. I mean, no, no, nobody can think that you know, doing things that are tremendously bad for, let's say, one's grandchildren's children is good. But still, it could be that this is exactly what we are up to. So, so we haven't clearly articulated, you know, uh, the, the long term. And, and, and therefore, uh, don't, don't, as it were, uh, uh, trace back the conclusions to what we could do today. Yeah, we are all kind of part of this society, and it's very hard to change it by yourself. And it's easy to think that somebody else does, does the change, you know, the politicians are the bad ones. And, and uh, I don't like the kind of like, actually, the, the consumer moralism that, that you, for example, when you're a green politician, people often, just think about, okay, so, so how do you live then? How do you change society in your everyday life? Okay, that's relevant for all of us, but that's not why I'm a green politician. I want the society to change for all of us to make the, the kind of environmental choices uh, easier and, and they have to be cheaper for everyone. So, so you have to make the kind of systemic change to, to, to measure in happiness, measure in environmental costs and measure in social costs. And that's the kind of challenges we politicians are facing and it's not very easy to to, to make that kind of changes. But I would like to also to, to, uh, comment on the question of choices we have in today's society. And, and I, I could recommend a book by Jonathan Franzen, Freedom, which many of you may have read, because I think it's a very, very good kind of 
today's Tolstoyan epic story about the kind of choices we are all facing with and the kind of hardness of having so much freedom that we don't know what we are actually wanting and, and lacking. And, uh, and uh, that means that we have to somehow be able to use the kind of possibilities we have in today's society, the kind of immaterial innovation uh, uh, solutions we have that can make life easier for us and can get the quality of life uh, better, that we actually use them for that good, that end, and not use them to get more kind of hurriness, more kire out of the way we work, because for example, this phenomenon that things don't have to be finished to be on the markets, it doesn't have to mean that everything we do, we kind of do halfway. It can also mean that we use open sources, that, that uh, in communities we create products and then we develop the products. Things don't have to be finished and, and be done with. Things can be developed together as societies and communities. And in, same, in the same way, we have to develop our approach to work. The work is not just a place where you go to 8 a.m. And, and leave 4 p.m. It, for most people already today, it isn't like that. But the kind of the structure of the society is that we think that work is that kind of a place. And what, one thing which I have promoted in, in the Ministry of the Environment is, is distance, distance work. We had the National Distance Work uh, Day last year, and it was very popular that people actually can use the kind of modern solutions we have that you go to, to, to your working place, you need to have some kind of uh, uh, community at work that you see people, that's important, but you don't have to do it every day. And then three, four days a week you can make it easier to combine get, taking care of, of children and, and getting them to kindergarten and being closer to home and doing work there than, than always doing the kind of like work is there and home is here. We have modern solutions to to be smarter than that, that they can make life easier and not more hurried. Willie, to what degree do you think that your colleagues in the ICT industry actually think about issues around this Kire and what the consequences are in terms of unintended effects and actually reflect at all, or is it just you know getting the thing out as soon as possible? Is that everything, any, the only thing that counts? Yeah, <coughs> obviously people do think about about them, but there's actually very little um, they, c they can do about it. I mean, it, it's especially the new services and products that get picked up by tens of millions of users. You don't know in advance what they're really going to do uh, with it and what, where this product and service will end uh, eventually, so it's extremely hard to predict. Have you ever thought about sort of unintended consequences of any of your innovations? Oh yeah, b b big time. Um, the, the current uh, startup we're running is called Microtask, and it's basically what we're doing is this massive global outsourcing of work. So basically slicing and dicing work into one or two second tasks and then sending them over the internet or mobile internet so that they can be performed, let's say in Southeast Asia. And uh, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with this. People now have access to this global human computer mm. with uh, human level intelligence, but uh, uh, it also raises a lot of pretty scary, uh, both moral and uh, ethical uh, questions because the fact that people are doing small tasks without understanding what the big picture is, is that they can, first of all, this something like this, this technology is kind of like nuclear. It could be used for good or evil that uh, governments who want to spy on their citizens or, or criminals who want to do large-scale scamming or something like that, they can easily tap into a technology like this. And also the fact that when people don't know what, what they are doing, uh, that's not necessarily a very uh, motivating thing for them. So we're, we're thinking about this, not, not only us, but the whole, this is called the cloud labor industry. So we're having quite a lot of discussions around these issues. We think that we can do some really interesting things in sol solving some of the global uh, work-related issues, for example, bringing massive amounts of work into Africa. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, there's many unknowns mm. you can't really prepare for.
And one, one problem with these issues, just want to touch slightly on this, is uh, I've talked this about, uh, about this with Jyrki Kasvi, who was previously a parliamentarian, one of the few who actually know, knows about cloud sourcing and all these kind of technological issues. And for le legislators, the problem with these kind of problems that are created by modern ICT solutions is that, that technology becomes politics and uh, most legislators don't realize the politics in the technological. So, so the moral questions of, of where is the limits of freedom in the internet and to understand that internet is actually a, a kind of a virtual marketplace where people have to have the same kind of freedoms we have in our everyday physical life. So you kind of like, you have to ha realize the positive uh, side of, of this kind of change. But at the same time, uh, managing it becomes very difficult from the viewpoint of politics and, and the kind of uh, problems that are created are hard to solve. What, what, uh, what Ville said uh, just now, I, I think it was really quite powerful reminder of the fact that, that, that uh, uh, we know less than I believe we believed earlier we knew. So uh, at the same time as there's more we should know. And, and, and also uh, a third dimension is that uh, although we de facto know less than we, uh, we, 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 we should know, uh, we, we somehow believe we, we live the, at the age of age, uh, of, of knowledge. And that there's this sort of pretense of knowledge. Uh, but but, but, but uh, the uh, entrepreneur of our panel here tells us that, that when you come up with the product, you just don't know how it goes. And therefore, you need to be able to rapidly react to whatever happens. And I, it seems to me this, this is a basic situation that we'll face in the future. But this, of course, means that there's going to be all kinds of unintended uh, consequences because you can only have intended consequences if you know the relevant facts. But the more complex the entire system becomes, the more difficult it is to know what even the relevant facts are. So, so in this situation, I think a key conclusion is that we should go back towards what we at least always know if we just are able to face uh, uh, ourselves uh, as human beings from this angle, that is that there are still things that are fundamental now, have, have been and will be, such as love. Love hasn't changed anything, a, a, anywhere. It's th exactly the same love as it always was. And it's, it's you know, uh, people still can be caring. People still can think about the significant and, and people can think about uh, the future. So, uh, so in this situation where uh, so, sort of epistemic ignorance regarding exactly what the facts are is increasing. I think we should go backwards towards our core in this kind of value terms and what we as human beings are, are and be more clear regarding that and, and from that on build the words uh, that it's kind of sustainable innovation uh, um, world that that, uh, that 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 this seminar is about let me just build on that and pose a question to our technological entrepreneur here uh, if you had easy access to the best well-being knowledge in Finland uh, as a company would you be able to uh, develop better products uh, than now yes so let's do it. <laughs> we have actually, the government has on its ag agenda opening all the public data we have in all kind of like Kela and the fin Ministry of Finance and we have a lot of public information which is now closed today and the kind of possibilities that the, the sol solutions that these, all these apps could create with that kind of public knowledge that, that there are huge economic and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, quality of life issues there involved if we open up the information. It takes a while to, to get all the, all the uh, uh, ministries to, to see the positive on that. For example, Ministry of the Finance likes to be the only one who has the official figures on the economy because they are not so widely criticized. And if they just tell that, oh, our computers tell that this is the fact. So, so it's, 
uh, nobody can challenge that. But I think society and public debate, and now we come to the core of democracy, we have to democratize information in that sense that everybody has as much as possible uh, access to it so we can all discuss about it. Uh, I think this uh, open data thing is a very good, good one and, and, and we should pursue that uh, with force. Uh, but I think there is, uh, with regard to my quest early question, there is uh, this problem of understanding here that, that uh, you, you can have a lot of information but you still don't ha might, might not have the uh, understanding of the issue. And I think um, what would, you know, companies can benefit from open data but they should also benefit or they could benefit if we could uh, uh, provide this understanding of people's needs and changing life circumstances and, and well-being better available. Mm. Uh, because ultimately the insights come from understanding. Yeah, I mean, th th that's exactly what we need. I mean, some of the questions I've been trying to ask from different parts of the, the government are things like that. In the future, I want to be able to create employment relationships that last only a couple of seconds. Mm -hmm. So how, how do we get the paperwork and the bureaucracy to work Ministry there? of the uh, okay. <laughs> economy then, probably doesn't relate okay, to that. Then, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we try to ask the taxman that we want to pay the people with virtual goods. Yeah. let's say a virtual cow in farm bill, uh, what is the cut of the government and where do we send it? And, and th these are, and I would love to have some kind of a forum for discussing. We, we kind of know that these questions are going to rise eventually and we've got to deal with them somehow. Mm -hmm. And it would be good if we could have a serious discussion about that. But I think that what I mentioned about the data, I think it's important that data still, I, I don't just believe that data tells how people feel, but we have a lot of data which could actually, if it's opened up, people can, and do it different combinations with that kind of data so we know that actually how people are, are feeling. If you cross-check different data from different organizations, you actually get to know more about how people, are, how for example, their uh, um, situation of how they're living is affecting their social and, and, uh, and health uh, uh, life, lifestyles and situations and, and we can cross-check them cross -check mm -hmm. that and, and develop something from that basis. We have a lot of knowledge which is not cross-checked uh, at, at today's level. <coughs> yes, we, we have more information than ever and, uh, and still, as I said, we don't know how to do good. We don't understand things. There are, from my perspective, there is an interesting phenomenon which we don't quite understand. And it is the fact that uh, uh, we know that uh, on a general level, uh, the mental health of the Finnish population hasn't gone down. But on the other hand, uh, the number of people who get uh, 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 on uh, uh, invalidity pension because of uh, uh, mental health and uh, specifically uh, young people, that number goes up and has gone up for a long time and we really don't quite know why. And uh, uh, my uh, idea is that uh, it relates to this, this understanding. Uh, the world for many young people doesn't simply make sense and that somehow relates to the theme of, the, of today. Uh, the, what has happened in the financial market uh, uh, has changed the world in, in many, many ways and uh, one is that uh, that has created uh, people with, uh, uh, with uh, huge incomes at the same time as there are people who don't get anything for their job and uh, and many young people simply don't want to contribute to that kind of a world. So therefore we see uh, every year thousands of people who are uh, under 30 who get uh, uh, on an invalidity <coughs> pension due to mental health. Uh, that might be one reason. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so my question somehow is that uh, why do we say make so small innovations? Why doesn't anybody think big today? Why don't we come up with the Big, uh, with big explanations, uh, uh, big theories about what is happening. It's a long time since, uh, for instance, Marx came up with his ideas about how this <laughs> world <laughs> works. The postmodern society is too difficult for today's <laughs> Marx, I, I <laughs> would think. Perhaps <laughs> the postmodernism mm. is uh, that you fraction everything to small pieces. Yeah, that is exactly. Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I think the, the, the current uh, academic world and research world is, is uh, the incentives there are geared to short-term publications and it's, it's not for uh, paradigm shifting 20-year uh, projects uh, like, like, or 30-year like, like he did. Um, 
Uh, but concerning this uh, 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 health problems and other problems of the youth, uh, uh, in this research project of ours on, on well-being, there is a project that uh, utilizes a, a theory called sense of coherence, which is by a, a, a famous medical sociologist, Aaron Ant 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 Antonovsky. And, and this uh, theory has been able to explain health very well and also well-being. And basically what it says is that, uh, that uh, people uh, who, have, who have a good comprehension of what is going on in the world, who can manage their daily tasks, and who have a meaningful purpose in their lives, uh, uh, stay healthier uh, and have a better well-being than those people who have uh, weak comprehensibility and manageability and, and meaningfulness in their lives. And, and what the research shows is that, that that sense of coherence increases over time and the, and, the, and the life course. So the younger people have weak sense of coherence and over time when you gain experience in life, you have stronger and stronger uh, sense of coherence. And this sense of coherence is under pressure in today's world. All, all these three dimensions are under pressure due to this transformation of our societies. And the young people have, has, have the less, least capabilities to deal with this. Uh, and they have the weakest sense of coherence. So that could be part of the explanation as to why we have problems, particularly with the, you, uh, the, the youth. So how much uh, funding does Tekes bring into these issues? I don't know about Tekes, uh, I only know about Citra, yes. Um, our research project, uh, uh, sorry, research funding is, is very limited at the moment. It's minuscule compared to Tekes, for example. Uh, but we do, as I said, we do have a research project, international one, on, on well-being. And recently Citra has uh, changed its strategy uh, and it's now focusing on sustainable well-being. So we are working on these three traditional dimensions of uh, sustainability. Uh, but also the, the, the new changing nature of well-being. So all of our activities are actually geared to understanding how we could live more sustainable lives and, and, and have better well-being in the future. I think uh, to understand sustainability broadly is very important that we also have an academic background. I've been a bit worried about the kind of academic focus of academic research as has gone so much to the short term and application that nobody has the kind of understanding of the big uh, level changes that are happening in our societies. Uh, but I, I think it, the, the challenge there is that we, we have to uh, try to also modernize the kind of approach we have to today's, today's societal problems because in politics still we kind of see that, that there are social Kind of like some issues are, are, has to do with poverty and, and social well-being and some other issues has to do with, with employment and third issues has to do with housing. But, but today's world is more about phenomena than about sectors. So, so we have to kind of change the approach also in politics that, that we don't try to uh, put the life situation of a person into a small box and then make a solution for that kind of a situation, a, a sector-wise solution, still kind of old-fashioned approach. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, the structure of the, the public system kind of sees that we are still living in, in the world of the 70s where we had long-term long contracts and, and labor market was kind of predictable. So social security is, is meant for people to be unemployed like half a year between 20 years industrial employments. So, so the kind of unpredictability and, and hardness of today's life meets also this kind of bureaucracy which tries to put you in a box. But you, are, you should be a, a, a manufacturer of these kind of goods and then we are looking for you a, a job there, but, but the, the, uh, the labor market has changed. So, so we have to uh, change. Now we are discussing <coughs> about how, what kind of school uh, uh, education system we are going to have in the future, how we are changing the, the elementary school uh, uh, um, div division of, of, uh, of um, uh, lessons to different uh, subjects. And, and there we are now more and more trying to focus on increasing the, the capabilities of young people to understand different phenomena media, democracy, being active, trying to solve things instead of giving them uh, information about different branches of, of knowledge.
to what a degree does um, the, the current innovation policy of the government reflect your ideas here? Uh, <coughs> I think this, this kind of approach that we see sustainability broadly, it's, it is creeping into innovation policy, but the problem is that the projects and approaches often are very getting more and more specified and narrowed because the technological branches, I mean, all, all subjects of, of human knowledge are, are going so deep that it's harder to kind of ha have this kind of disciplinary cutting approaches, but that's, that's, the, that's where we are trying to head. So we, we have, uh, as goals, we have, uh, have uh, socially, uh, kind of like socially uh, inclusive, uh, low carbon projects, for example, that, that would benefit the economy and, and these kind of innovation uh, uh, focuses and, and that also these long term costs would be, would be more visible in, in the way we do innovation. But, uh, but I think it's, uh, the problem there is that, that uh, how you can combine the small different innovations into a kind of coherent whole. That's in today's world, it's really difficult. We are discussing about the kind of like uh, big umbrella concepts and very small solutions. And it's hard when you have hundreds and thousands of solutions that how, how they make a coherent whole. But uh, there, there are a lot of possibilities there. One, one approach which I could say is that, for example, we have these uh, low carbon communities, Hili Neutral Kunta Hanke, uh, which Suomen uh, Ympäristökeskus is, is, is uh, leading and, and uh, communities like Uusi Kaupunki have uh, managed in just a few years to diminish almost 20% of their carbon emissions, created over 300 jobs in a small community by looking at what everything the, the community does and what the companies in the community do, that that, that would be fixed from a low carbon viewpoint. And, and I think that's the kind of future that, that in all, all different uh, public uh, procurements and public involvements in, in, in innovation, we are trying to mainstream uh, phenomena instead of thinking about the sector, that now we give a lot of money to information technology, a lot of money to cables. What about um, Institute of Occupational Health? In some ways, we, one could say that you, you are taking care of the unintended consequences of uh, organizational innovation <laughs> perhaps organization or failure i don't <laughs> know <laughs> but but the innovation yes uh, uh, we are trying to change our mindsets as well we have uh, for uh, if you look at finland we have for a hundred years we have looked at risks and tried to redu reduce risks and uh, we have come to the conclusion that that's not enough it and uh, especially in a, in a very uh, rapidly changing world, that's not enough. And uh, we, have to, we have to look at the, uh, that the, the resources. It's, uh, uh, this uh, Antonovsky's uh, theories are very useful here. We have to see why is it that, uh, that uh, people can manage even if, uh, if life is hard. W what are the resources that, uh, that make some people manage and some other people not? And, uh, uh, so that is this uh, the so-called salutogenic approach to health is something that we are now uh, trying to understand ourselves and also trying to change the whole uh, uh, work health policy. It's not an easy task. Uh, as I said, we don't even understand quite ourselves what it means. But only uh, only looking at, at risks that that's not uh, that's not good enough. So we have to change our, our, our ways to, to, to think. And um, uh, relating to this, I think that, uh, uh, I think that uh, the late Penti Malaska uh, he said that uh, in Finland we are too focused on technological innovation and, uh, uh, and, and leave this, uh, the social innovations aside. And I think that uh, we should take that seriously. Yeah. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, we should uh, we should really think hard about how to change our attitudes toward towards work. Uh, there is uh, an increasing problem with the fact that uh, that some researchers say say that uh, 
uh, half of the people who uh, get born this year are going to live more than 100 years. Think about that. And in Finland we work uh, uh, plus 30 years of our life. Uh, that's simply not possible. So we have to think about how can we, how can we make a world where people can m work much, much longer. It uh, quite obviously, it demands something quite new from our work. We have to make work uh, uh, worthwhile. I mean, it, it, ha it has to be something that we want to do. And many people do, mm. but, uh, but uh, most people don't. Let's be, be frank about that. So we really have to think about those. Uh, th these are the big, big issues. We, we are, our economy is simply uh, don't cope unless we find s quite new solutions to these things, and I would say that we are not looking for them for the moment. Hanken is a is a business school, um, and many of, of you sitting here <coughs> are are in the business world. Now we have been talking about some very very big issues here. What does philosophy have to say about? So practical issues. Are there anything practical that sort of can come out of? of well, well I, I think uh, what, what I first referred to is very, very practical. Don't believe your own bullshit. <laughs> uh, and, 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 uh, but, but more generally, at the same time, if you think about the fact that, that uh, I mean, to me, this is a fact that as human beings, we are miracles and we are capable of miracles. Th to me, this is an obvious fact. A and uh, it's, I think it's a fact on the communal level, like, let's like say, the country of Finland in the Second World War type of miracle. But it's also the kind of little miracle uh, that Key here referred to in context of, you know, uh, somebody <coughs> facing very, very hard facts in his or her life and somehow making it beautifully uh, as a result of that, let's say, cancer. And, and flourishing as a result. The human being is capable of this. So, so from my point of view, it's these two lessons that come out from this discussion. So on the one hand, don't believe your own bullshit. So this means being critical, being, being, being uh, open to challenge one's mindset and the prevailing, dominating what, uh, uh, paradigms. And, and the book that, that is going to be published just now is, is I, I think it's, it's a beautiful step in that direction. And, and, but second, at the same time, I think we really should not overlook the fact that we are miracles. And therefore, we should also, I think, look at ourselves and what we can do together from that angle. And I, of course, it's, it's a very, very good, say, optimistic or positive, whatever perspective. But I think it's a factual perspective. And it's, it's, it's a perspective that I, I think we, we really need uh, alongside with the more negative one I, I started out with. But we also need this, this, this positive uh, the, the dimension. So I think these are, the, from my point of view, the, the uh, key, key lessons uh, from, from philosophy, or at least from my kind of philosophy. Thank you. Um, I think ta it's time now to invite some questions from, from the audience. Can we? Yes. I would like to go back to some concrete issues and uh, ask your uh, opinion that uh, how will the protection and funding of innovations change in the future? Now you have been talking that uh, we need innovations which make us happy and uh, <coughs> concerned with well-being and or sustainable things and, and so on. So uh, who should actually finance these kind of innovations? Is it sort of the companies or is it the public sector or, or how can they be financed in the future? And also one thing that in case we make innovations which um, sort of make people happier, 
So is it ethically okay to protect these kind of, kind of innovations? How could they be protected? I would like to ask you. Okay. Thank, thank you. Did you hear up there her? Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, the letter. Yeah, uh, I think that, that that's a very good question. Also, how we protect the existing innovations we have uh, that are functioning well and not changing something which is working is always also a, a good point. But, but my kind of societal uh, analysis is that, that politics and democracy has to create a kind of a, a system where norms and taxation and, and the public procurement and the kind of what we, where we direct innovation as, as the public system, it has to promote uh, the kind of innovations that are socially just and environmentally, environmentally good. And then the innovation actually comes from the companies, individuals and people. Because if the state tries to innovate and, or tries to decide what, what are the branches of, of sectors of, uh, of the economy where the best innovations lie, that often fades. But sales has to provide the means for, for good basis for, for innovation. And, uh, and um, when it comes to the innovation policy and the kind of, there we have uh, state structures like the Academy and, and Tekes and, and Citra. Uh, I would hope that they would be uh, kind of like that these kind of um, concepts uh, that are cross-cutting, cross-sectoral, these kind of concepts uh, should be supported by these institutions, but they don't choose the sectors. All sectors can say that we have, we have new low carbon solutions that create IT homes for people or IT homes for people who with, with uh, handicaps that, that they actually get a better quality of life and so on. So what does Citra say then about this? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I would say that, that uh, uh, our traditional um, way of uh, uh, looking at well-being and, 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 and business is that, that they are often seen contradictory. Because we've seen well-being as meaning the same as the welfare state, which uh, something uh, means high taxes, uh, which tend to be bad for business. But uh, I would argue that well-being actually, if, if we had a, a, a sound and, and thorough and holistic understanding of well-being, that could be a source of competitiveness for the firms. And that is because ultimately products and services uh, create value for their customers if they contribute to their well-being. So people buy things and services uh, because they think that these things and services contribute to their well-being. And so if we understood well-being better uh, than, or Finnish firms or firms working in Finland would understand well-being better than firms operating from some other countries, they would be able to create more value to their customers, and hence they would be more competitive in the marketplace. So I would argue actually that uh, well-being and competitiveness of firms is, is tightly interlinked, and we should develop our understanding of well-being to contribute to our, our businesses. And so I, I would think that uh, uh, sophisticated firms would finance innovation towards well-being uh, uh, from their own interest. Uh, but I also think that we need uh, public inputs to these processes because uh, the government always provides some public goods and services. And it would be good if those public goods and services would also enhance firms' competitiveness. Uh, so one has to be uh, very careful also in allocating public funds. Okay, thank you. Uh, Henrik. <coughs> My name is Henrik Lux. I'm a retired parliamentarian. Thanks to all of you for very interesting interventions and for a very interesting discussion. Guy Jahonen was here urging for the big theory. I'm not coming with it. What I'm, I, will, I would like to bring in a dimension you haven't touched upon. It ha might have more to do with don't believe your own bullshit. <laughs> Uh, it has to do with understanding our well-being, uh, mental health, uh, ignorance, and fundamentals in life which do not change. And the link between this ignorance, poor understanding of well-being, and uh, the difficulty in foreseeing un, uh, uh, unintended consequences. 
it's our culture. And if this has to be a question, I will ask you, do you agree with me when I say <laughs> that um, our culture is very keen on recognizing us human beings as rational beings and is to a very large extent overlooking man as an emotional being. This creates a lot of problems. We are very poor on meeting each other's on an emotional level. I know there are also some psychotherapists here around, so I won't go deeper into this. But having these shooting in universities, in schools, etc., etc., uh, extreme examples of bad mental health, I think that we should put more emphasis on trying to understand the human being as an emotional being which or who hasn't very much changed over the last thousands of years. So the question is, do you agree with Henrik on this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a yeah, yeah. Here. yeah. Well, I, I for one completely agree and, and I, th I think what this is very much to the point because uh, ba basically what uh, Henrik here was saying was that uh, we, we need to recognize uh, ourselves uh, and our fellow human beings more as we de facto are. And de facto we are also emotional beings uh, and it's, it's, it's also that dimension that, uh, that plays a pivotal role in, let's say, uh, the experience of meaning and recognize something as significant. Uh, something can't be really significant if you don't feel it as significant. So, so therefore, I, from my point of view, uh, many of the prevailing paradigms and uh, economics, I think, is, is, is here really is, is the leading case. It's, it's, it's very, very bad for the, the, the overall philosophy we have of ourselves and therefore of society because it, it, it offers to us a perspective that overemphasizes the rational oh. and, and downplays the emotional, downplays the kind of uh, dimension that truly makes us ultimately human. But it's, it's all those together that we need in the context of the kind of effective, sustainable innovation to the future that, that Karel here is talking about. Thank you. I believe we have one Short question, Almudena. Hello, my name is Almudena Canibano. I'm a PhD candidate at the London School of Economics. Um, thank you very much for a very interesting discussion. I was thinking about going back to one of the challenges that Karl Heinz mentioned before about increasing participation of workers and users in innovation. And thinking, well, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts about whether that is going to be a positive or a negative for well-being. A positive because it increases control over the innovation itself, because they participate, or a negative because it's, it's building on this uh, additional demands and uh, um, reduced boundaries of whether what, what the innovation starts and finishes. Timo? Uh, I, I personally think that it's, it's, it's good to start start with uh, but there is there is a slight problem which is that uh, it seems that uh, we as individuals do not understand really well our well-being at the moment I mean I'm repeating this message all, all the time but that seems to be the case uh, based on, on some research evidence and and so um, we cannot only rely on inviting users in and, and, and having them say because they don't necessarily know themselves so we need to help them we need to also bring in research and other means of understanding uh, their well-being this actually just one brief yeah. comment yes, ju just just has to do with the the kind of that we are emotional beings and and it has to do with also what you were saying about we have to change our attitude towards towards work that that if we uh, can make young people to understand that they have uh, some kind of uh, a coherent place in this world, which many are kind of now losing, 
we have to change also the structure, how the democracy works, that people can be more involved, more active, feel that I can change things. This uh, includes products, but it will includes the whole of the political system and, and how people are seeing their, their position in, in working life, that they can, during their life, uh, 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 flexibly uh, change the amount how much they work and what kind of work they do that they feel that they are in control of their lives. I think this is this is one of the big challenges. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, invigorating energetic panel that has gone from the micro tasks <laughs> to the big issues of the capitalistic economy. Um, uh, let us all give the panel a hand.